Um, so uh, the presentations, this is the, the format we're going to follow. So chapter one, or the first one, is going to be on physical activity. Um, and so the title of that will be a systematic review of the relationships between objectively measured physical activity and health indicators in school-aged children and youth. And that will be brought to you by uh, Dr. Veronica Portress, who's with the HALO group at the Children's Hospital of Eastern Ontario Research Institute as well. Chapter two will be on sedentary behavior. Uh, the title of that will be a systematic review of sedentary behavior and health indicators in school-aged children and youth, an update. And uh, Dr. Travis uh, Saunders will be doing that on behalf of Dr. Val Carson. Uh, Val's from the University of Alberta, Travis from the University of Prince Edward Island, where he's an assistant uh, professor. And he'll explain at that point why it's an update uh, in comparison to the first talk, which uh, isn't an update per se. Chapter three is on sleep, which uh, hopefully you won't be doing by that point. Um, and it's a systematic review on the relationships between sleep duration and health indicators in school-aged children and youth. We can see a bit of a pattern happening here. And that'll be brought to you by Dr. Jean-Philippe Chapu, also from the HALO group in Ottawa and uh, assistant professor of pediatrics uh, there. Chapter four will bring it together try and convince you, if you're not convinced already, that the whole day matters. Um, and so that will be the presentation on the Canadian 24-hour movement guidelines for children and youth and integration of physical activity, sedentary behavior, and sleep. And that will be brought to you by yours truly. And then finally, we'll, uh, we'll chat a little bit about so what. So we've been doing these, you've heard of other guideline releases and, and so on. So even if you're convinced that this is the route to go, uh, so what, what does that mean to you? And so uh, that presentation will be titled The Implications of the New Guidelines for CSEP Certified Professionals. Some talk, too, probably about how it relates to uh, researchers, and that'll be brought to you by uh, Lori Zare, who's uh, co-organizing uh, this, uh, this conference from Camison College and former president of the Canadian Society for Exercise Physiology. Okay. Thanks very much. It's a pleasure to be here to speak to you today about the Physical Activity Systematic Review. So we'll just jump right in. Okay, so I don't need to convince all of you that physical activity is important for health promotion and disease prevention. And in this regard, physical activity guidelines in Canada and many other countries around the world recommend that children and youth get at least 60 minutes each day in moderate to vigorous intensity physical activity, or MVPA for short. And while this MVPA is certainly very important, this only accounts for a small proportion of each day and there's emerging evidence to suggest that all intensities of physical activity may be important for health, including light intensity physical activities like active play or incidental activities of daily living. And this is important because children and youth spend about four to six hours each day in those light intensity physical activities. However, no guidelines include recommendations for light intensity physical activity. And this may be due at least in part to the historical focus on MVPA and in part to the use of subjective assessments of physical activity like questionnaires that can't accurately capture light intensity physical activity. And so in order to inform such recommendations and to better understand the relationships between different intensities of physical activity and health indicators, a scientific evaluation of these relationships is needed. And so the purpose of this study was to perform a systematic review that examined the relationships between objectively measured physical activity in terms of overall or total activity and by intensity and relevant health indicators in children and youth aged 5 to 17 years. And second, to examine the association between various patterns of physical activity and health indicators. So to do this, we searched four major online databases for studies that met our inclusion criteria. And to be included, studies had to be uh, peer-reviewed and either published or in press, and they had to meet our a priori determined population intervention comparator and outcome, or PICO, criteria. So the population of interest for this review was apparently healthy children and youth with a mean age of 5 to 17 years, where apparently healthy was defined as general populations, including kids with overweight and obesity, but without diagnosed medical conditions. The intervention or exposure of interest was various volumes, durations, frequencies, intensities, and patterns of objectively measured physical activity, so measured by accelerometers and pedometers, for example. And the comparator was the same. 
There were 11 outcomes of interest, ranging from body composition to self-esteem, and these were chosen by expert consensus among a 27-member panel with expertise in movement behaviors. And they were chosen based on the literature and uh, to, with the recognition that it was important to include a range of holistic health indicators, uh, including measures of physical, psychosocial, and cognitive health. All study designs were eligible for inclusion in the review, but for logistic reasons, we did impose minimum sample size requirements based on the study design. And studies had to be in English language or able to be translated, and we excluded gray literature and conference abstracts from the review. The quality of the evidence in the review was assessed using the GRADE framework, and I could easily spend a full 15 minutes talking to all of you about GRADE, um, but I'll just give you a brief overview here so that when we talk about the quality of the evidence in the review, you can see where these ratings come from, and this will be relevant for the next two presentations as well. So according to GRADE, the overall quality of evidence is assessed separately for each health indicator or each outcome and for each study design for each of those outcomes. And the quality of evidence ranges from high to very low with four levels of quality. And when we talk about quality of evidence, what we are referring to is the level of confidence in the estimate of the effect. So the higher the quality of the evidence, the more confident we are in the findings, and the lower the quality of evidence, the more likely it is that future work will change our level of confidence in the findings and possibly change the estimate of the effect as well. So according to grade, RCT started rated as high, and all other study designs start with a rating of low quality evidence. And then from there, the quality of the evidence can be rated down or up based on five criteria. So first, the quality of evidence is rated down if there's a serious risk of bias across studies. And in this review, we use the Cochrane Risk of Bias tool to assess risk of bias in experimental studies. And in observational studies, we assessed the risk of several types of bias, including detection bias, attrition bias, and performance bias. Quality of evidence is also rated down if there is serious inconsistency, and this is defined as unexplained heterogeneity in the direction of the effect. If there's indirectness, um, meaning differences in the population, the intervention, or the outcomes in the included studies and those of interest for the review, so for example, if there are uh, surrogate measures of outcomes instead of direct measures of those outcomes, then that's considered indirectness. And the quality of evidence is rated down if there's imprecision, such as wide confidence intervals that lead to uncertainty about the actual magnitude of the effect. Quality of evidence can also be rated up based on certain conditions. For example, if there's a large magnitude of the effect or if there's a dose response gradient, because these are things that increase our confidence in the evidence. So all of these factors together uh, influence how confident we are in the findings and therefore influence the quality of the evidence. In terms of data synthesis, meta-analyses were not possible in this review because of heterogeneity in the measurement of physical activity and in the measurement of the outcomes. And so narrative syntheses were conducted structured around the intensity and the amount of physical activity and around the different health indicators. And it's important to note that all of the studies were weighted equally in this narrative synthesis. So we identified almost 10,000 records through our online database searches and another handful of records uh, through other sources such as checking review articles. And after we took out the duplicates, there were just more than 6,000 records remaining. The titles and abstracts for those records were screened against the inclusion criteria by two independent reviewers and exclusion by both reviewers was required for the articles to be excluded. Then the full texts were screened against the inclusion criteria for the remaining 499 papers and ultimately 162 studies met the inclusion criteria and were retained for the review. So of those studies, the vast majority, as you can see, were cross-sectional with very few experimental studies and longitudinal studies. And data across the studies represented more than 200,000 participants from 31 countries uh, with a mean baseline age ranging from 5.1 to 17.7 years. And the quality of evidence, according to that grade framework, ranged from very low to moderate across the different study designs and the different health indicators. 
So I'll take you through the results starting with total physical activity. So this is physical activity of all intensities combined. And just to orient you to the figure, what you're looking at here is the 11 different health indicators along the x-axis and the number of studies on the y-axis that showed favorable associations in green, null associations in gray, and unfavorable associations in red. And so uh, the first thing you can see here is that several studies examine the relationships between total physical activity and indicators of body composition, cardiometabolic biomarkers, and fitness, with far fewer studies examining all of those other health indicators. But overall, the results were predominantly favorable, indicating favorable associations between total physical activity and the range of health indicators that were examined. If we look at the same figure for MVPA, so just one subset of total physical activity, you can see a similar pattern of findings. Um, relative to the findings for total physical activity, there was a greater proportion of favorable associations. And one thing that you can't see from this figure is that, uh, in general, those effect sizes were also larger. And this was something that was seen fairly consistently that higher intensities of physical activity had more consistent and robust relationships with the health indicators than lower intensities of physical activity. If we look at the figure for light intensity activity, this looks substantially different. And there's a couple of things I want to point out to you here. The first is that you can see right away there are far fewer studies that actually looked at light intensity physical activity. Second, there were more null than favorable findings. And there were even some apparent unfavorable relationships. So 15% of those relationships were unfavorable. And the reason I'm calling them apparent unfavorable relationships is because there's a couple of important things for us to keep in mind when we're interpreting these findings. So the first is that it's possible that there's a problem with how we're measuring light intensity physical activity. Um, so it may be that the existing accelerometry cut points don't effectively differentiate light activity from sedentary behavior. And so these unfavorable relationships may just be related to how we're measuring light intensity activity. Second, for time to be spent in light activity, it has to replace time that would have been spent in some other behavior. And so an increase in light activity at the expense of MVPA may indeed be a negative thing. Um, but if we're replacing sedentary behavior like screen time with a light activity like active play, this might be beneficial. And certainly both of these hypotheses deserve further exploration. There were, however, consistently favorable relationships with certain cardiometabolic biomarkers. And so it's worth considering that light intensity activity may be an effective substitute for sedentary behaviors. If we look at specific patterns of physical activity, there were nine studies that examined the relationships between sporadic physical activity or bouts of physical activity and health indicators, where sporadic MVPA was defined as less than five consecutive minutes and bouts as the sum of MVPA accumulated in five, 10, or more consecutive minutes. And these studies showed consistent favorable relationships with body composition, cardiometabolic biomarkers, and fitness. And importantly, equivalent volumes of activity had a similar impact on the health indicators, regardless of how that total dose of physical activity was achieved. So in other words, five minutes of MVPA here and five minutes there was the same as having 10 minutes all at once. And there was also evidence of a dose response gradient. So the larger the total dose of physical activity, the better the impact on health indicators. And these patterns of physical activity were not examined uh, for any other intensity of physical activity. But overall, these findings suggest that in this age group, all activity is important and it can be accumulated in small doses throughout the day. And the more physical activity, the better. There were 12 studies in the review that specifically examined the impact of meeting versus not meeting the current physical activity guideline cut point of 60 minutes of MVPA per day. And they consistently showed favorable relationships with all of the health indicators that were examined. And so this just continues to provide support for the current 60 minutes per day guideline. The primary limitation of this review is that all of the included evidence was very low to moderate in quality. And the main reasons for rating down the quality of evidence using GRADE um, were because of concerns with risk of bias across studies and because of those unexplained inconsistencies, so places where there were mixed favorable, null, and unfavorable findings without a really clear explanation as to why. As I mentioned, all studies were weighted equally in the narrative synthesis regardless of their quality. 
and there were limited data for certain health indicators, uh, especially measures of psychosocial health. Strengths of the review included the use of a comprehensive search strategy that was developed and peer-reviewed by librarians with expertise in systematic reviews, and the inclusion of only objectively measured physical activity, as well as a wide range of health indicators. And this is also the first systematic review to include all intensities of physical activity, including light. There's still a lot of work that needs to be done in this area, however. Um, first, there's a need for high quality RCTs to investigate cause and effect relationships. Um, there were very limited data for six health indicators in particular, and so there's more work needed to understand the relationships there. Work is also needed to identify how to accurately capture light intensity activity. Um, and to isolate the intensity that best differentiates light physical activity from sedentary behavior in relation to health indicators. And lastly, more studies are needed to identify the optimal dose of physical activity in order to achieve health benefits. So to conclude, the findings continue to support the importance of at least 60 minutes a day in moderate to vigorous physical activity, but also highlight the potential benefits of light activity and total physical activity. The most consistent and compelling evidence in the review is that more physical activity is better and all intensities of physical activity should be considered in future work. So a review this size is an absolutely massive undertaking and would not have been possible without all of these fantastic individuals as well as, as, well as our funders, so thanks very much. Thank you. All right, good afternoon. Uh, so I apologize in advance for those of you that came to hear Dr. Valerie Carson talk. Um, unfortunately, she wasn't able to be here today, so uh, she's asked me to present on her behalf. Uh, she very generously uh, provided me with her slide deck, so I'll do my best to present this uh, on her behalf, and uh, I'll take credit for any, any errors or omissions or my introduction. Um, so Val led this project with her team at U of A. I was involved in a, in a much smaller role. Um, for those of you that are interested, it's been published along with the rest of the papers today um, in the special issue on the guidelines, so, and it's open access, so you can uh, um, access that right away. Uh, okay, so, so this talk's focusing on sedentary behavior, and I know that sedentary behavior is, is not something that everyone works with on a day-to-day -day basis, so I just wanted to briefly uh, talk about what, what we mean when we talk about sedentary behavior. So when I say sedentary behavior, what we're talking about is... Uh, is any waking behavior characterized by both a low energy expenditure and a sitting or reclining posture. Okay, so we're not talking about the lack of physical activity. We're not talking about a low level of steps. We're actually talking about things that are done while sitting. So basically, anytime you're sitting down, unless you're actually exercising while sitting down, you're probably engaging in sedentary behavior. So everyone that's sitting here is being sedentary. Those of you that are standing are not, um, according to this definition. And so, of course, the stuff that we've traditionally always cared about is the, the moderate and vigorous physical activity up here. So we think in terms of METs for kids, that's four METs or above, is considered moderate to vigorous physical activity. So that's the stuff we've known for a long time is really good for health. From one and a half to four METs, that's the light activity. So the stuff that we're starting to realize is probably good. And then below 1.5 METs, that's what's considered sedentary behavior. So, so you can't burn less calories than when you're being sedentary, so long as you're alive. It's, it's the end of the scale. Um, so common sedentary behaviors are things like just simply sitting, um, but also things like reading, watching TV, using a computer, sitting in a, sitting in a car. So like I said, anytime you're sitting or lying down, you're likely being sedentary. And now one thing I want to highlight though is that this is only talking about waking behaviors. And, and so JP in a second is going to talk about sleep and how important sleep is for health. So we just want to distinguish, even though sleep, you know, involves lying down, doesn't involve very high energy expenditure, we, we distinguish that from sedentary behaviors. This is only waking behaviors that are, are sitting or lying down. So, so why should we care about sedentary behavior? Well, it, the evidence over the past 10 or 15 years has started to accumulate to suggest that sedentary behavior is, is quite bad for your health. So back in, in 2011, um, Mark and Alana LeBlanc and a, and a group of us led a review um, summarizing all the available evidence linking various types of sedentary behavior and health indicators in school-aged children. So in that review, they found 232 studies with data from almost a million kids. And the, the conclusions were that sedentary behavior in general, but especially TV viewing, were associated with unfavorable body composition. So kids were heavier, they had more body fat, they had larger waists, um, they had lower fitness, so they couldn't run as far or as fast, uh, lower self-esteem, uh, worse pro-social behavior, and decreased academic achievement. So basically across the board, if, if you take a, a, an important physical or mental health outcome, 
it tends to be negatively associated with, with sedentary behavior in general and TV time in, in particular in uh, school-aged children. So, so despite you know, summarizing the state of the evidence at the time, and this was used to inform Canada's first sedentary behavior guidelines, there were a number of important key evidence gaps that, that were identified. So at the time, there were very, very few um, high-quality experimental studies. So the vast, vast, vast majority of those studies they identified were cross-sectional. Uh, a few were longitudinal, but, but most were cross-sectional in nature, uh, and very few were actual intervention studies. Um, also, the vast majority of studies um, use subjective measures of sedentary behavior. So sedentary behavior, like physical activity, we can measure using an accelerometer, but we can also use, um, use self-report questionnaires or proxy report questionnaires. And the vast majority of that time, we're using questionnaires that just simply ask kids or their parents or their physician how much time they spend watching TV or playing computers or sitting. Also, there was basically no, no focus given to, to novel forms of sedentary behavior that are getting a lot more popular. So things like smartphones, tablets, other small screens, texting, um, all those sorts of new screens where kids are spending most of their time, were, there was really no evidence on them at the time. And then the, the last thing was not really an evidence gap so much, but just sort of a, pointing out that we have really only cared about the physical health impact of sedentary behavior for 10 or 15 years. And over that time, the research has really exploded and evolved quite quickly. And so one of the other key, key conclusions of that review is that the evidence really needs to be reevaluated on a regular basis to make sure that we have evidence-based reviews because the evidence base is just growing so quickly in this field. So that brings me to the, the purpose of the, the present review. So the purpose of this review is to simply update um, the review that was done in 2011 to look at all the new evidence linking sedentary behavior, both, both objective measures like accelerometry and inclinometry, and subjective measures like self-reported screen time or self-reported sitting time with health indicators in school-aged children. And then a secondary purpose was to determine what, what types of sedentary behavior, so TV viewing versus reading versus computer versus sitting, um, the doses of sedentary behavior, so, so the amount of daily sitting or the, the typical bout length of sitting um, that were associated with health in this population. So, so just like uh, Veronica's study, I'm going to go quite quickly through these methods because it's very similar, and so I'm glad that Veronica um, covered this so nicely. So just like her review, this one had a PICO. So the population, once again, was um, apparently healthy school-aged children. The intervention was any duration, patterns, or types of sedentary behavior. The comparator was simply different types, duration, patterns of, of sedentary behavior. And we didn't require that, that it, there be an actual control group, so we did include studies that were just a, a simple correlation study or a regression model. Um, they didn't have to actually have a, an explicit control group. And the outcomes, uh, like with Veronica's study, we identified uh, six outcomes. Um, four were deemed to be critical. So these were body composition, um, risk factors for metabolic syndrome and cardiovascular disease, um, academic achievement, and behavioral conduct, pro-social behavior. And then we had two, the two outcomes that were identified as being important. So those were um, fitness, which could be either aerobic fitness or musculoskeletal fitness, or self-esteem. And I should mention that these outcomes, because it was an update of the earlier review, these, these outcomes were dictated by that earlier review. So we stuck with the same outcome, so it was truly an update. Otherwise, it, it wouldn't have actually been an update of that review. So, so grade, just for anyone who, who's come in since Veronica went over this, um, we use the grade approach to identify the quality of the evidence. So we did that for each health indicator and also each type of study design. And so once again with grade, um, the quality of evidence can be rated as high, moderate, low, or, or very low. Um, RCT is coming as high and everything else comes in as, as low. And as she mentioned, uh, data can be upgraded um, based on large effect size or a dose-response relationship, and it can be downgraded for, for bias, inconsistency, indirectness, and imprecision. So um, like with her review, we weren't able to do meta-analyses, just simply there was a, a, a very large amount of heterogeneity in terms of the way that sedentary behavior was measured, um, in terms of the outcomes that were assessed and the way those outcomes were measured, so we weren't able to do a, a meta-analysis with the data. Um, so instead we did a, a narrative ana analysis, and so we did this separately for each health indicator and also for each type of study design and each type of sedentary behavior. Uh, and then, just like with her paper, all studies were weighted equally. So a very large study wasn't weighted more heavily than a small study. So, so here are the, uh, the, the search results. So just to highlight a couple things. So the initial search brought in about 13,000 um, titles and abstracts. Um, once they were deduplicated, that came down to about 8,300. Then um, 
through that title and abstract screening, brought it down to just under 1,000 articles that needed to be full text screening. And then after reading all those full texts, that brought it down to 235 studies that met all criteria. So I just want to highlight, I, I feel like I can sort of brag about this a little since I was a little more removed than the rest of them, but like Veronica mentioned, this is a tremendous amount of work. I mean, the, the folks at Halo and, and Val's lab at, at U of A, like to, to screen 8,000 abstracts and then do full text screening on 1,000 papers and then extract data from 235, they're just a huge amount of work. So I think they, they deserve a lot of credit because this was a, a lot of work in a, a very short period of time. So now we'll go over the, uh, the key results for each health indicator. So just to orient you here, so the first um, indicator is body composition. So here we have the total number of studies, which is 162. This is by far the largest um, area in terms of publications. Uh, then we have the, the N, so about 1.5 million um, participants. And remember, this is just in the last five years. So this is only published since 2011. So a huge number of studies here, the vast majority of which were cross-sectional. And the quality of the evidence was rated as very low to low. And, and where it was downgraded, that was mostly because of risk of bias, because most people, or a, a large number of studies were using subjective measures of sedentary behavior that weren't validated. So they didn't publish or, or have any sort of information on psychometric properties. Um, but that being said, the, the summary of findings for body composition was that higher screen time, and in particular TV viewing time, were significantly associated with unfavorable me measures of body comp um, across types of study design. So, so generally speaking, screen time and especially TV viewing associated with, with uh, in a negative way with body composition. When we look at uh, risk factors for metabolic syndrome and cardiovascular disease, um, smaller number of studies here, just 31. Once again, the, the majority were cross-sectional. And uh, once again, the data here was very low for the same reason as before, um, mostly self-reported with, with questionnaires that weren't validated. And here what they saw was that TV viewing time was negatively associated with a clustered um, cardiometabolic risk score. So what that means is that basically they, a number of studies looked at individual health risk factors like insulin or glucose or blood pressure, but then quite a few studies also combined those into some sort of metabolic syndrome score or a global risk score. And that global risk score was consistently associated in a negative way with TV viewing time. When we look at behavioral conduct or pro-social behavior, again, there were a smaller number of studies here, just 24. Um, the data ranged from very low to moderate, depending on the type of study design. And here what we found was that higher TV viewing time and video game use were significantly associated with unfavorable measures of body composition, or excuse me, behavioral conduct and pro-social behavior. And, and so I should highlight these, these summaries of findings. So these were the consistent associations. And, and so the thing that wasn't seen as much were associations for other forms of sedentary behavior um, or for objectively measured sitting. When we look at the, the last critical outcome, academic achievement, there were 16 studies identified. Uh, once again, uh, very low quality of data just based on, on, uh, on the risk of bias. And here, higher reading and homework outside of school were actually positively associated with uh, academic achievement in the longitudinal studies. When we look now at the, the outcomes that were deemed as important, um, fitness was identified in 21 studies. The data was low to moderate quality. And what we found was that higher screen time in general was associated with, in a negative way, uh, with lower fitness scores. And then finally, self-esteem was identified in 10 cross-sectional studies with about 80,000 participants. Once again, very low quality of data. And here, uh, screen time in general, and in particular computer use, were both negatively associated with self-esteem in those 10 cross-sectional studies. So, so here, one of the other purposes was, was also to look for specific doses of sedentary behavior that were associated with risk. So what we have here on the y-axis, we have the number of studies that looked at a specific threshold of sedentary behavior. And here on the x-axis, we have those specific thresholds of sedentary behavior. So to orient you, for example, these studies all looked at, at a threshold of one hour a day of sedentary behavior and looked to see if those kids that had more than an hour a day had increased risk for some health indicator compared to kids who had less than an hour a day. These studies looked at one and a half hours a day as a threshold, two, three, four, and five hours a day. All the, the blue bar represents studies that showed a, a significant relationship between that threshold, so a significantly increased risk for kids who are above the threshold, and the red bars indicate um, a null association. So the, the thing you can see here is that basically regardless of what, what threshold was used, whether it was an hour a day, an hour and a half, all the way up to five hours a day, Generally speaking, across all the health indicators, kids who had above that threshold, whatever the threshold was, they tended to have increased health risk compared to the kids that were below the threshold. The other thing that you notice is that most of the data tended to cluster around two hours a day, 
which is not surprising because that's what the original Canadian sedentary behavior guidelines were, the Australian sedentary behavior guidelines, and the American Academy of Pediatrics. So, so it seems like basically whatever cutoff you pick, the kids who are above that cutoff are going to have increased risk, but uh, it's especially clear and, and well studied at two hours a day. So to look at some, some general conclusions, um, different types of sedentary behaviors seem to have different impacts on health. Um, so depending on which health indicator you're interested in, seems to, to determine which type of sedentary behavior is most important. Broadly speaking, TV viewing and screen time were the ones that came out as being most significant in, in, a, in the most consistent manner. Um, like I mentioned before, objectively measured sedentary behavior or sitting time wasn't consistently associated with any of the health indicators. Um, but, but there was sort of a, across the different ways of measuring sedentary behavior, there was this general gradient that, in general, less sedentary behavior is better for kids, and especially screen time. So a, a few key evidence gaps, and I, I find this, this slide a little bit frustrating because they're, they're essentially the exact same evidence gaps that were identified in the review that Mark and Alana led back in 2011. So once again, the vast majority of studies were cross-sectional um, and used subjective measures of sedentary behavior. Um, so out of the 235 studies that were identified, 200 of those used subjective measures of sedentary behavior and only 35 used objective measures of sedentary behavior. So still very few studies using objective measures of sedentary time. Um, and not only were studies using subjective measures of sedentary behavior, but most of those measures were unvalidated. So we don't know what the psychometric properties are. Um, we don't know if they're reliable. We don't know if they're valid. Um, so it's actually quite impressive that, that we're seeing such consistent relationships for screen time when you consider that these are not particularly, um, particularly strong questionnaires methodologically. Um, once again, very few studies looked at new types of, of technology. So, you know, smartphones, tablets, you know, the, the types of sedentary behaviors that kids are spending the vast majority of their time engaging in just simply aren't, aren't measured by these questionnaires. And, and the wording doesn't even necessarily get at them. You know, if a kid's watching Netflix or YouTube, do they consider that TV time or do they consider that computer time? And, and so, the, it, again, it's, it's quite impressive that, that we're seeing these relationships given sort of how crude some of these questionnaires are, given the way that kids are using sedentary behaviors at, at the present moment. Um, and then again, very few studies looked at, at things like bout length of sedentary behavior, interruptions in sedentary time. So we don't have a good sense of, of how those things impact health. Um, so some, some strengths and limitations that we saw in the data. So as Veronica mentioned with her study, um, you know, this is a very comprehensive peer-reviewed search strategy. Um, it was inclusive of a variety of forms of sedentary behavior, um, both subjective and objective. It was uh, it, it is inclusive in terms of various types of study designs and a, and a large number of health indicators. So, so very comprehensive review. Um, at the same time, because of that being such a broad review, we weren't able to do meta-analyses. Um, and we weren't able to include some health indicators like anxiety or depression because they weren't included in the original review that we were updating from 2011. Um, so I'd just like to, to end by uh, acknowledging, again, all the people that were involved in the project. It was a very large group, um, especially uh, Laura, Shanice, and, and Genevieve, who, who helped out with the uh, screening process, and Jesse McGowan, who helped uh, with the peer reviewing of the search strategies, and then obviously to uh, all the groups that helped fund the project. So now um, I'm happy to take any questions. And I should mention if there's anything that, that I can't answer or that, that the other folks that were involved can't answer, um, I'm sure Val will be more than happy to answer any of your questions if you uh, want to send her an email. So thank you very much. Questions? I'm going to wait. <laughs> thank you. Good. Hello. Hi. Thank you. It was a good talk. Uh, Thanks. I appreciate the, uh, the work that everybody's been doing, uh, with getting this information out. I'm Peter Wallach. I'm uh, an emergency physician uh, back in uh, Red Deer, and I have a special interest in this. Um, over the last 25 years, I've had uh, close to 80,000 patient visits, and I'd like to talk to at least 20,000 people, parents and uh, patients, to try and understand what, why they exercise and why they don't. It's always been kind of a conundrum why people come into the emergency department with uh, illnesses and especially with, when you see what's uh, happening now. We've seen a lot of children that have, uh, that have uh, watching them uh, when they've been occasionally in the emergency department but then coming up through and becoming young adults and don't see a lot of information talking about uh, any longitudinal studies following uh, that group that basically becomes our, our uh, 
what's going to be the uh, Achilles heels for the uh, for the uh, healthcare system in the future? Has there been any work done in that area? And you've you've done quite an extensive review. You might have seen stuff like that. So you're talking about sort of longitudinal studies, following looking? following people that are just in activity and then follow this following uh, case if it's possible to go and follow case by case or or um, be a, be a quite a magnum of study, but it. Uh, has there been any work done like that? So there have been a few studies on self-reported sedentary behavior to see, um, mostly looking at body composition, I think, um, looking to see if, say, you know, sedentary behavior or screen time in your teenage years is associated with your, your BMI or your risk of obesity in adulthood. Um, and generally, they, they do see a relationship there, um, but, uh, but not as many, like I said, the vast, vast majority so far are cross-sectional. I, I imagine people are starting to look at that more because it, it is an important question. Um, does that does that answer yeah. what you're asking? Yeah. yeah, yeah. So there and there have actually been just a recent systematic review looking at at prospective studies, um, and they, there were far far less studies that they were able to find compared to what we looked at because they only looked at those prospective studies. But there are a few out there. Do you find it uh, focusing? Because the research, and I understand, it's, it's one of the few measurables that we have uh, that that you can actually do within seconds uh, to you'd be looking at BMI or. Uh, uh, the relative weight to uh, the best weight that a child could have or even a teenager could have, that that kind of sends the wrong message. Because if you, uh, the College of Family Physicians went and published a paper in, uh, I think, or um, a synopsis of uh, 19 years of uh, work on uh, doctor's counseling, where you have, you have the counseling direct face-to-face, -face, uh, looking at the impact of talking about exercise and weight reduction. And, the, yeah. and you take cohorts that basically you did not even touch with that information. And compare the two populations, the ones that got counseled and that did start to get involved in programs, ended up with being 0.5 kilos heavier at the end of their uh, their event. So there's something about this message about focusing on a product approach, a, pr a production approach like weight, mm -hmm. versus looking at just the the process of uh, the experience and stuff like that about yeah. exercise that seems to be uh, killing any type of uh, interventions that we're attempting. Yeah, no, and I I agree that I. Focusing too much on weight can definitely be a be a, a problematic way to go about it, and I think that's one of the nice things that you know, looking at such a broad range of health indicators, that it's not just weight that's associated with screen time. You know, if you're more interested in in, in you know prosocial behavior, academic achievement, or even risk factors for diabetes, there are a lot of a lot of good reasons to reduce your screen time and sedentary behavior. It's not not just about weight necessarily. Is there a way to take a study? Because again, these are markers you have to use. But is there a way to take a study like this and kind of absolve uh, when the information comes out and, and redirect the uh, thinking to or we're looking at not about weight reduction, we're, that the message should be about the proper things about just getting more time? I don't know. I think that might come down to, to messaging a bit. I mean, one thing I will say is that, and I've been as guilty as this as anyone because I've done a few of these studies, but we don't need more studies looking at cross-sectional relationships between screen time and BMI because there are, you know, hundreds. Um, so I think that's where we need the research is to focus on those other areas. And I think you know, the goal of this was to summarize what is the state of the evidence, and I think right. that's partially in the messaging is how we choose to relay that to the people we work with might not be focusing on the, on the body weight part necessarily, depending on who we're working with. So a couple of comments about this is that looking at a population base that are um, between five years of age where a child's pre-abstract, uh, looking at children are between six and ten that are basically very dependent on measures that their parents are putting in place, and then looking at young adults that are basically a uh, whole different population, it looks like you're confounding a number of different biases in here by bringing these different populations that really, uh, you're, you, if you've, once you hit the teen years, you're, you're autonomy. There's a lot more autonomy. And I, I find that uh, looking at these studies uh, as a medical community, we kind of look at them with kind of a jaundiced eye of, of their, that they're just, they're just a mixed match of, of studies. Any, has there been anything that looked specifically at populations that are more um, homogeneous and so a, lo a lot of these individual studies would have done that. So okay. a lot of these individual studies we were looking at looked at kids, you know, eight to ten or ten to twelve. Um, this is just sort of the summary of all those studies yeah. all together. And, and I'm not sure Mark might touch on that a little bit more when he talks about the guidelines as a whole, why we looked at that that specific full range as opposed to a, a, a different range. Is there? Um, I guess the fun. Yeah, please. We did look at age effects. So there are a number of additional sub-analyses that weren't presented here that we did. And so we looked at 
uh, 6 to 11 year olds and 12 to 17 year olds to see if the evidence base was different such that we should have different guidelines for elementary school age kids and high school kids just to make something up and there was no evidence of that. The evidence was uniform across ages so if the study was on 5 to 6 year olds or 16 and 17 year olds, of course the methodologies are different and, and, and the populations are different but the findings are uniform. So it's actually the evidence that we had from the various studies reinforce the fact that this whole school age children population that these the guidelines will ultimately get to uh, are applicable. Thank you. Thanks. There's still time? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Travis. I was live texting Val to tell her that you did a good job. Great, thanks. So screen time during the screen time talk. Screen good. time during screen time. I have my computer on you. We don't know if it's bad for you yet, so it's okay. <laughs> so, you had self-report or subjective measures of screen time under the limitations of the study, but given what we know about kind of all of sedentary behavior, so what you'd get from objective measurements like accelerometers versus the negative effects of screen time, often associated with energy intake, that kind of stuff, what do you, th like, I just don't know if having subjective measures of screen time is a limitation, because how else do we get at the fact that they're watching TV and not reading a book or playing quietly. Because even standing is less than, often less than 1.5 mets, so it doesn't really meet the definition. So like from an accelerometer cut point, you may be sedentary when you're not doing the same thing. So I just wonder what then in your, in your mind would be the kind of perfect measurement of right. sedentary behavior. Yeah, and so that's a good question. And I think I should say, you know, I, I, I've swung back a lot over the past five, six years. I used to be very much in the objective side. Now I've swung back because the, the associations are so much stronger for the self-report. Um, and, and so I think they're, they're weaker in pure methodological terms, but the, the associations are much stronger for the self-report. So it's measuring something real, um, whether it's actual, the, their actual amount of screen time or not. Um, and I think the, the, the new thing that, that obviously has some limitations, but it's this sort of life logging, you know, where you're wearing a camera on a necklace that actually takes pictures of what you're doing, and you can tie that to inclinometry or, or accelerometry, so you can tell not only are the kids sitting, but you can tell that they're sitting and reading a book or, or sitting and, and, and uh, you know, watching TV. And I think short of direct observation, which obviously we, we can't do in a population, I think that's sort of the ideal. Uh, it has some obvious limitations of, of having a kid wear a camera all day, but I think it's, that's the ideal in terms of methodological quality, at least. Thanks. Hey, thanks for OK, hi, everyone. I think we have uh, 20 minutes before the Jays game, so you should be still here with me. So I'm very happy about that. Uh, after physical activity and central behavior, we'll move on to sleep. So that will cover the whole spectrum of movement behaviors. And then Mark will present the actual guidelines. So my name is Jean-Philippe Chapu. And yeah, my second time on this podium, I'm very happy to be with you uh, here this afternoon or, or tonight to talk about the link between sleep duration and different health outcomes in children and youth. Okay, so uh, something I can say as well. So if you want to know more about those studies that we're presenting today, they're all published in APNM this year, open access, so you can download that. Just go to, to PubMed, so this is the, uh, this paper on, on sleep. I was the first author. I was leading the sleep part of the guidelines. So we know that sleep is good for you, good for physical health, good for mental health. There's a lot of studies out there. But this is the first systematic review uh, to look at the influence of sleep duration on, on a lot of uh, health outcomes in children and youth, uh, a critical period for growth and development. So we tend to use the sleep guidelines in the U.S., so from the National Sleep Foundation. You have uh, those recommendations from the newborn to older adults. Of course, here today we talk about children and youth, uh, so from 6 to 17. For us, that was from 5 to, to 17, but the guidelines in the U.S., they start at 6 for uh, school-age children. So they have between 9 and 11 uh, hours per night for uh, school-age children, and between 8 and 10 hours per night for teenagers between 14 and 17 years old. So the goal here was to know first, does it make sense, those guidelines? If not, can we change those? To have Canadian sleep guidelines as part of the 24-hour movement behavior guidelines. 
So the main goal, the main aim of this uh, paper, this study, was to look at the relationships between uh, objective, objectively measured and subjectively measured sleep duration and different health outcomes in children and youth aged 5 to 17. Uh, methods, so the population, same uh, as for the two other papers, so apparently healthy children and youth aged 5 to 17 years old, intervention exposure comparator, so various sleep durations, and the outcomes here we had a lot, so adiposity, uh, emotional regulation like anxiety, uh, the, the depression symptoms and so on, cognition, academic achievement, quality of life and well-being, harms in injuries and cardiometabolic biomarkers. Uh, we, have, we had the very similar cut point, so we used an N of 30 or more for intervention studies and an N, a sample size of 300 participants or more for observational studies. So we had a lot of studies, so we went back for one of those outcomes, the first one, adiposity. So there were a lot of studies looking at sleep and adiposity. So we raised the bar from 300 to 1,000 just for this outcome to make sure that we don't include too many studies. We wanted to have the, the best one and make sure that we can manage our uh, review here. So in the end, we included 141 uh, papers in the systematic, system, this uh, systematic review on sleep duration and health outcomes. Results, so overall about 600,000 uh, participants from unique samples, about 1 million uh, for all of 141 studies uh, from 40 different countries around the, the world. Most of them, 79% were cross-sectional studies, 18% uh, uh, prospective studies, and only 3% were, were run, run, randomized studies. 84%, uh, so the vast majority, use as subjective measures of sleep, so self-report mainly, and 16% use an objective measure of sleep, and it was mainly with uh, actigraphy. So we call that actigraphy in the field of sleep, so uh, wristwatch, but for the physical activity field, we call that accelerometry. This is the same, same device or, or same thing. Uh, results, I think it's a bit small here, so uh, the first one, Adiposity, we had 71 studies. The quality of evidence ranged from very low to moderate. So most studies, 58, uh, report a significant association between short sleep duration and adiposity. And 13 studies reported uh, null findings. And no studies uh, showed the opposite. For uh, emotional regulation, 62 studies, uh, the quality of evidence ranging from very low to high. Uh, 49 of those studies reported that longer sleep duration was associated with better uh, emotional regulation, so a good thing. 11 studies re reported null findings, and only two studies reported uh, opposite associations. For cognition, only six studies, uh, ranging from very low to moderate quality. Um, five studies reported mixed findings, and one study reported null findings. For academic achievement, 21 studies, all very low. 14 studies reported that longer sleep duration was associated with better academic achievement, and six studies reported null findings, and one study uh, opposite associations. Uh, for quality of life and well-being, only three studies were published uh, in children and youth, uh, very low quality of evidence, and all three studies showed that better quality of life well-being uh, was associated with longer sleep duration. For harms and in injuries, four studies were published, all very low quality of evidence. Uh, two studies reported mixed findings. One study uh, showed that short sleep was associated with more in injuries, and one study reported null findings. And finally, the last uh, outcome, cardiometabolic health. 19 studies published, ranging from very low to low quality of evidence. And very mixed here, 11 studies, uh, mixed findings, six studies, null findings, one study showing that longer sleep was associated with adverse cardiometabolic health, and one study reported opposite association. So I hope I was able to read that because it's very small here. So overall, the key findings, so it was very small. So we, those studies were showing that longer sleep was associated with lower adiposity indicators, with better uh, emotional regulation, with better academic achievement, and better quality of life well-being. Or you can reverse that, so short sleep was associated with, so that was the same thing. So no U-shaped association in children that 
that's what that's what we tend to find in adults. There was no uh, U-shape, so the longer sleep, the the better for those outcomes. There was mixed or limited evidence for cognition, for harms and in injuries, and for cardio cardiometabolic health. And the quality of, of evidence ranged from very low to high across study designs and health indicators for the sleep systematic review. Uh, four points that I want to discuss maybe with you here. First one, I think overall we can see there's a weak evidence base to inform the sleep guidelines. Uh, it relies heavily on cross-sectional studies with self-reported sleep. So I think we still need expert opinion to come up with what is uh, the good dose or the good recommendation for sleep. Uh, we know that sleep needs vary between people, so it's never one size fits all. Our sleep needs are mainly explained by our genes, uh, so it doesn't mean that it will be the same recommendation for everyone. Uh, there is also the thing with the range versus a threshold value for sleep duration. So the National Sleep Foundation in the US, they use uh, a, a range for sleep duration. So between this and that should be good for physical health and mental health. But uh, just uh, two months ago, the American Academy of, of Sleep Medicine in the US, they came up with their own uh, sleep recommendations and they use a threshold value. So for example, for kids, they say nine hours or more. There is no maximum of 11 hours. So that will fit with what we find here because it seems that the longer is the, 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 the better. But I think there are pros and cons with that as well. I think for me, long sleep is a marker of uh, poor sleep most of the time. Uh, so I think it might not be bad to have a, a range. So both options can be good, I think. Uh, and also we have to keep in mind, and that's part of the guidelines too, so this is only sleep duration here, but many other aspects of sleep are important, so also sleep quality, sleep timing, so bedtime, wake up time, uh, con consistency, and so that, that means day, day to day, so we know that we see a lot of, cat of uh, catch up sleep on, the, on, on weekends for, for teenagers, and of course we don't want, you don't want to wake up all the time during the, the night, so you won't have one bout of sleep uh, during your, your night. So there's many aspects of your, of your sleep that are important beyond just uh, the amount or sleep duration. Uh, so conclusion, so three take home messages from this paper on sleep and uh, health outcomes. So I think we confirm uh, pre uh, previous studies showing that shorter sleep duration is linked with adverse physical and mental health outcomes in children and youth. Uh, however, the, avail the available evidence relies heavily on cross-sectional studies uh, using self-reported sleep duration. So we need more uh, robust designs in the, in the future with more objective measures of sleep to assess also quality, not just duration. And I think in the future, to better inform sleep guidelines, we will need uh, more sleep restriction extension studies uh, that examine changes in different outcomes against various amounts of sleep to have a better sense of those response relationships. So for example, uh, that, that can be different between people, but also different between outcomes. So maybe the range between nine and 11 hours of sleep can, be, can fit for some outcomes, but not others. So we don't really know that. So I think the approach that we took, so uh, we cannot really change the sleep guidelines because the evidence isn't that strong to go against what has, what has been done in the US. So, and Mark will present also the, the 24 hour guidelines, but I think we, uh, decided to keep the 9, 11 hours and the 8 to 10 hours. But the only small difference is we start at five years old because in Canada, uh, most school age kids, uh, kids, the school start at five years old. In the US, it's six. That's the only small difference. But we, uh, we stick with the US sleep recommendation as well for the 24 hour guidelines. So thank you very much. That was, uh, that's it for my part. And now we'll uh, continue with Mark. And I'm available for questions as well. Hi, it's Donna Wilkes from SickKids. Thank you very much for a great presentation. I think your point about um, uh, having more variables looking at quality and timing of sleep is well taken, for example. So what if um, it's, it's said that your evidence looked at, you know, longer duration seemed to support some of your hypotheses, but what if 
kids are sleeping longer because they're waking up in the middle of the night and therefore they, they wake up for a certain period and then they have to sleep longer. So um, I think the point is well taken that there needs to be other uh, variables collected in, in, in the sleep um, domain um, before you can uh, say for sure what is exactly going on. Yeah, I fully agree. And also there's many when we think about uh, children and teenagers, I think parents have a role to play as well when we think about uh, school start time. So we don't really change that, even though I would like to postpone a bit for teenagers because it doesn't fit their, their hormones. They, yeah. they, they are supposed to go to bed a bit later and wake up later. Uh, but I think the only way we can have a, a good night's sleep is to go to bed early. Otherwise, they have to wake up early. And there are many things we can also talk about, the, the screens in the bedroom that can impact sleep quality the, and everything. Yeah, so the those sleep, sleep tips. So uh, yes, we need to go beyond duration and include other characteristics of sleep. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. I just have a quick question. Yes. Um, in the part where we talked about physical activity, they talked about accumulating it in bouts. So do you think that the same might apply in terms of accumulating a total amount of sleep in a 24-hour period? Say you have five hours of sleep at night and then you take a three-hour nap in the day, which for kids wouldn't be enough, but the point stands. Yeah, uh, that's a good point. So uh, yes, I think napping is very good. Uh, in general, we can say that five plus a nap of three hours, it's five plus three. So uh, that's eight hours of sleep in your night. It's probably better to have your eight hours in one bout during your, your, your night. And also timing matters as well. So if you go to bed at 3 a.m. and always wake up very late, that can be a bit different for your hormones. But in general, yeah, napping is good and you just add those hours. So if you lack sleep and you catch up with napping or something, yes, it, it, it's a good thing. So listen to your, to your body if you feel tired, so go to bed and sleep. And sometimes yeah, you have a short night, night's sleep, but you can catch up the day after. And that's what studies are showing. If you look at hormones of different things, yeah, the acute effect of lack of sleep is a stressor for your, for your body. But as soon as you have a good night's sleep or napping, all of those hormones come back to normal. So it's possible to restore that. But on a chronic basis over time, if you repeat always your bad sleeping habits, that can uh, bring some problems down the road. But yes, I think uh, roughly speaking, uh, you can add your hours of napping to your night if you don't sleep enough and that will be good for your health. Okay, just out of curiosity too, have there actually been studies done on the long-term effects of breaking your sleep up over a 24-hour period? Breaking it? it? Like what? so napping rather than getting a full night of sleep? Yes, it yeah, yeah, there are, oh, yeah okay. there are studies showing that, yeah, so napping is good uh, over time, yeah, yeah. But chronically, it's best to get it all in one chunk? Yes. Awesome, thank Better you. Better in one chunk. Hi, uh, Yvonne, kinesiologist. Um, so you said that sleeping too long can be um, poor quality of sleep, so what are some of the things that can affect children's quality of sleep and what, like, what should you look out for? Yeah. So this is coming from, because I had like, tonsils and adenoids removed when I was young, and now I see family members maybe having some issues. So um, those and, and some of the other factors for poor quality of sleep. Yeah, yeah. There are many things that can affect sleep quality, and those factors uh, will be different between people. So it's important to address the root causes of the problem on a case-by-case -case basis. I think, yeah, it can be due to screen time. It can be due, if it's a sleep problem, so that's a different game. But when I think what we tend to see in the modern way of, of, of living is that we sleep less for quality of life and pleasures. So we just cut, we decide to restrict sleep duration. Uh, and then that can impact sleep quality. But in general, yeah, it can be uh, the blue light coming from uh, our screens. It can be noise in the, in the room. It can be uh, that chaos in the, in the house. It can be you, you, you sleep with uh, someone else. Uh, someone is, is snoring uh, beside you. Your room is, is not dark. Uh, your mattress is not uh, comfy and so on. There's many factors that can impact sleep quality. And I think we need to address all of those factors to make sure that, yeah, when you go to bed, you feel tired. So that means that you're active during the, the day, you're physically tired when you go to bed. The best pill to have a, a good sleep quality is to be active uh, every day. And most people in Canada, so we know 9% of kids meet the physical activity guidelines. So there's this inactivity epidemic. And I'm sure that because of that, that impacts sleep quality. And it can become a vicious uh, circle. 
How's everyone doing? Good? All right. We're on the home stretch here. Um, so now I'm going to talk about the 24-hour guidelines, a little bit of the background about uh, why we went this route, uh, some of the methodology for actually uh, forming the guidelines, which might be uh, of interest to some people, and then ultimately what the guidelines are and a little bit of uh, looking ahead. So they're, they're called the Canadian 24-hour movement guidelines for children and youth and integration of physical activity, sedentary behavior, and sleep. And so just a couple things about the title themselves. We spent a lot of time <laughs> on the title. Um, and we are aware of the fact that sleep to most of you is not a movement behavior, that sedentary behavior to most of you is not a movement behavior, but they're non-movement behaviors, right? They're an absence. So if you think of movement on a continuum, they all fit there. Um, and uh, in the absence of any better word, that's what we've gone with. Um, the order of things in the second half of the title, an integration of physical activity, sedentary behavior, and sleep, was done deliberately that way to reflect the fact that it's a Canadian Society for Exercise Physiology initiative. We're the physical activity experts. We're not the sleep experts. But we're beginning to understand that how we sleep affects our physical activity, and we'll talk a little bit about that. And uh, these guidelines were released publicly on June 16th of, uh, of this past year. And I'll talk about the figure here and walk you through it and what some of the meaning of it is uh, towards the end of the presentation. So just a, a little bit of background and rationale. Um, we've got these three components, physical activity, sedentary behavior, and sleep. We know from the previous three presentations that these are related to health, all kinds of health outcomes, some stronger than others, but almost always uh, a uniform direction. Or in some cases, lots of null hypotheses, but very rarely do studies show the opposite direction. So, uh, you know, it gives us quite a bit of confidence that there's something good happening there from a public health messaging perspective. We also know they're related to each other. JP just said that the best recipe to have a good night's sleep is to be physically active during the day. The best recipe to not be physically active the next day is to have a poor night's sleep, okay? And, and so on and so forth, all these different uh, combinations of things. So just as an example, we know that regular physical activity is a good thing. We saw that from uh, Veronica's presentation. It's associated with all kinds of positive health outcomes in all age groups. But if, uh, if we spend a lot of time sedentary when we're not being physically active, the benefit, the size of the check mark there, is much smaller. This is our typical lifestyle. This is my lifestyle. Pretty good at getting my regular run in each day. Also pretty good at sitting the rest of the, the day. Um, and so there, the evidence, the totality of the evidence suggests that that's not nearly as good as if I did my run, but didn't sit most of the rest of the day. And you can imagine the different combinations with sleep there as well. And so this has prompted us, and has for probably a decade at least, to start to think about this whole movement continuum that you know, these things are interrelated. They're not different bubbles, okay? And we've had this temptation to, to sort of talk about very little actually in our world about this end of the spectrum and quite a bit of time on the intense exercise end of the spectrum. But these, these are related to one another and the effects, the benefits we're gonna get from vigorous physical activity is gonna be somewhat dependent on what our sleep pattern was like the previous night and how much we sat during that day, how much light activity we had and so on and so forth. And to disregard that is just to disregard a whole bunch of confounding, especially because that intense activity piece is a teeny weeny type part of the day, even for the most active of us here. It's 1% maybe, the moderate to vigorous, maybe 4 or 5% for the most active of us, which leaves 95% unaccounted for. Now it's kind of like saying, you're gonna, I'm gonna take my heart medication um, and it'll only work for one hour of the day, and then the other 23 hours, I won't have that medication working. No, that's why we do time-release medications and so on, because it, the whole day matters. We need that exposure across the whole time period. And so, so the evidence is reasonably clear that these all matter. So, so how do we go about doing this? Uh, I mean, it, it did take probably about eight years to get people on board to go with this integrated type of approach to, to, to buy into it. 
once we did that, then we followed um, a recipe, really, that uh, Bill Haskell and I wrote for uh, a chapter in this book, Physical Activity and Health, a, a couple years ago, uh, which maps out, here's the robust way to develop guidelines of this nature and walks through all of the, uh, the systematic review and, and so on. I won't go through all that with you, um, but to say that we followed a very robust, transparent process. And it took two years, you can't see this, but the top there says October 2014, and the bottom is October 2016, here today. Uh, that's what the last box is, is this symposium presentation. So about two years of um, intensive work um, to, to get these guidelines developed. Of course, time ahead of that uh, to try and find funding to make this happen, which just for your curiosity, um, these take, they cost about a million dollars roughly, I'm closer to 1.2 for this one, but uh, the, the other one we're doing now, we're a little bit better at it, it's around a million dollars to do all of the background work, to have the experts come together, to prepare a launch and media strategy and uh, develop uh, um, nice artwork and so on and so forth. So just FYI, it's not, it's not a small undertaking. And it began with, after a leadership committee was formed of the various funders, uh, which I talked about in my introductory slides, um, we assembled a guideline consensus panel of 27 members. My very last slide of the presentation, I'll, I'll uh, acknowledge them again and the different people and different expertise that we bring together for that. That group then helps to inform what we're going to do. What are the variables that we need to study? Um, uh, what are the outcomes of interest? What types of studies should be included? How should we uh, limit things? What should the inclusion, exclusion criteria be? And so on. Those are all done a priori before we go out and start this stuff, done uh, by consensus by the group. Then we conducted, in this case, four systematic reviews that included approximately 600 papers. Um, uh, we also did some original analyses, which I'm going to present here, um, a, di a different way of trying to get at uh, the questions that we're trying to answer here. Um, uh, looking at the various relationships between physical activity, sedentary behavior, sleep, and a whole host of health indicators. After we'd done that, and we'd done these compositional analyses that I'll talk about, then we draft the guidelines. We, the consensus panel, the 27 people. We sit around and we wordsmith for three days. It's really fun. Um, but we were in Montebello, so if people are familiar with that, it's, it, it is kind of fun. <laughs> um, and so, so anyways, we draft guidelines. And then we went out to you. Uh, many of you, I'm sure, answered our, our surveys. And we said, OK, here are our draft guidelines. What do you think of them? This is the title. What do you think of it? This is the preamble. What do you think of it? These are the guidelines. What do you think of them? Are they clear? Uh, do you agree with them? We also, um, we also had focus groups um, in English and in French um, uh, that fed into that. And then we finalized the guidelines based on the feedback from the stakeholders, uh, from the, uh, the focus groups. Um, and then we translated and back translated so we were sure that we had uh, the, the guidelines available in English and in French. So that's kind of tip to tail the way the process goes. Uh, and going forward, of course, we need to implement and activate them. So the evidence from the systematic reviews, I'm not uh, going to go through. You just, you just heard all that. But we did that in totality. And there was a fourth one that didn't fit into this uh, symposium because there would have been too many presentations. The fourth one down there, we did a systematic review of papers that looked at combinations, any combination of the three behaviors, physical activity, sedentary behavior, and sleep. Could have looked at all three of them. Could have looked at any pair of them. So that was a separate systematic review. That review was actually led by, by Travis Saunders. And I just want to show you, because it, it wasn't there, but just in, in one or two slides. And so when we looked for those things, and some are out there, there were 14 studies, around 40,000 participants from 20 countries. Quality of evidence was low, fairly consistent with the others, which is telling you, you know, they're, uh, they're not randomized studies. Key findings, that if you had this clustering of high levels of physical activity, high levels of sleep, and low sedentary behavior, so that the good combination of three things. It's more, it was associated with more desirable uh, adiposity, cardiometabolic uh, health indicators, when compared to three bad combinations, okay? So moving well, sitting a little bit, um, and sleeping well is better than, than the antithesis of that. 
Some only looked at a couple of the variables, so high physical activity and high sleep, or high physical activity and low sedentary behavior was associated with favorable health outcomes compared to low physical activity and, and low sleep or low physical activity and high sedentary behavior. Most of this is probably intuitive, but, but the, the uh, available published literature is supportive of that. So in summary, the optimal health benefits may be achieved by replacing sedentary behavior with moderate to vigorous physical activity. That was the strongest thing. And it comes out in all the systematic reviews. It's going to come out in the compositional analysis that I'll show you. If you're going to trade off, trade up to MVPA and trade it at the expense of sedentary behavior. So I mentioned the compositional analysis. So this was a, an, an original study that we did to help inform the physical activity guidelines, uh, or the 24-hour the movement guidelines, sorry. Uh, I'll probably make that mistake again. Uh, they're 24-hour movement guidelines, not physical activity guidelines anymore. Um, and so what this compositional analysis allows us to do is take um, existing, in this case, cross-sectional evidence and play with the different compositions to see how that may be associated with different health outcomes. So it actually allows us to get at some of the evidence that we frankly didn't find in the systematic reviews. And this is published as part of the, the supplement as well, open access, um, and the first study of its kind um, in the world. So movement behaviors have traditionally been assessed in isolation. You've been hearing about that, but um, they actually affect one another. Because the constituent parts along this continuum sum to a whole, it's 24 hours, that's all there is. You can't stretch it to 25 as the CHR deadline looms, we wish we could, but you can't, it's still just 24 hours. Um, and so if I am going to increase my MVPA, it has to be at the expense of something else, which means those variables are codependent. They're not independent, okay, they're codependent. And so I could increase my MVPA at the expense of sedentary behavior, which I've already told you is probably, and in your intuition tells you, that's probably the best thing. But I could do it also at the expense of light activity, or I could do it at the expense of sleep. And which of those I choose influences the likelihood of the, the association with a health outcome. And traditional statistical procedures like multiple reg regression um, are, they, they violate the assumptions uh, of, uh, of independence because they are codependent. You can only add one minute here at the expense of one minute there. And so those traditional analyses, which almost everything that's published in all of the, the papers in, in Travis's review, um, th they're fundamentally flawed analyses. It doesn't mean their findings were not the same as you would get if you did it correctly, but they're fundamentally flawed and they're geometrically incorrect. Um, and compositional analyses allows us to get at this, uh, which is a, it's a complicated uh, mathematical thing. It's been around for a long time, just hasn't been used in health research very much. And so we were, uh, we were applying it here. And what it does, it takes various, it, and it analyzes the proportions. Because if I add a percent of my 24-hour period over here, it's at the expense of somewhere else. So, so you can play with the different cocktails of combinations of sleep, sedentary behavior, light activity, MVPA, carve it whatever way you want. And then you can shuffle things around a little bit, okay, using, uh, using ratios of time as opposed to the actual empirical value. So, um, so the purpose uh, was to examine the relationships among movement behaviors, sleep, sedentary time, and physical activity, and health indicators similar to, to the others. We use the Canadian Health Measures Survey from Statistics Canada, our direct health measures survey in Canada. We had a sample size of around uh, 4,000 of kids in this age category. We used cycles one to three of the CHMS and merged them. Um, we looked at sedentary time, light intensity physical activity, moderate to vigorous intensity physical activity, all measured objectively with accelerometry, and sleep duration subjectively measured um, by questionnaire. And we looked at a host of health indicators similar to the other systematic reviews. Um, and we had direct measures of these, okay? We actually collect biospecimens on, on the sample, and, and so these, um, these are direct measures, so fairly robust. And what did we find? Well, we found that this is the distribution of the day on a, on a typical Canadian kid, 6 to 17 years of age. Um, so uh, roughly the same amount of time sleeping and sedentary, a chunk of time where we're not doing MVPA, but we're not being sedentary, so that's that, 
that vague light activity kind of a chunk of the pie, but it's rather a substantial piece. And you can see there just that sliver, which traditionally we as exercise physiologists, that's, that's our bread and butter. That's what we're focusing on. And in fact, we focused on it so much that we've disregarded all the rest of the pie, which hopefully seems obvious to you that, that that's a fundamental flaw in what we've been doing and in the way we've been counseling individuals and so on because the whole day matters and hopefully I can convince you of that. So the key findings, the composition, the composition, the totality, the, the cocktail of movement behaviors was significantly associated with all of those health behaviors, statistically significantly associated with every one of those health indicators. So the composition matters. The cocktail of behaviors, the amount I sit, sleep, stand, walk, run, matters. Not just how much I run, not just how much I sleep, the cocktail matters. The portion of variance ranged a lot, uh, depending on the particular indicator, from very little to a rather substantial amount. The analyses showed that replacing moderate or vigorous physical activity with any other behavior was the worst thing to do. And this is interesting because compositional analyses allows you to look at things and they, they are not symmetrical. When you do a regression analysis, if you add 10 minutes of this, you're going to get a certain effect. If you take 10 minutes away, it will be the inverse of that effect. It's not the same with compositional analyses. They're not symmetrical that way. And so the worst thing to do is to take away existing moderate to vigorous physical activity. That's way worse than the benefit of adding an equivalent amount of physical MVPA. So the maintenance of our existing healthy behaviors, at least in terms of exercise, is more important, that's what our analyses showed, um, than adding new stuff. Adding new stuff is really good as well, uh, but the, the effect is not as large. So the findings highlight the importance of moderate to vigorous physical activity. It's certainly the most powerful dose. But it also supports the importance of time spent in the other movement behaviors, that, that we, can, we get additional benefit if we have good behaviors in that other 95, 96% of the day. So MVPA is certainly the most potent dose, but the other parts matter as well. So going back to the second slide where I showed the smaller check mark that, you know, if I'm getting my exercise, that's good. If I'm getting my exercise, but I sleep poorly and I sit too much, then the size of that benefit, of course, is smaller. Makes sense. Similarly, if I don't buy into the exercise and I don't get exercise, I can still make a check mark there by sleeping really well and by regularly interrupting my sedentary behavior. I can make some progress. So think about this in terms of how you would counsel your clients for those that are, that are the practitioners out there. It just gives you way more entry points to talk to a person about how to, how to slowly adjust their lifestyle. In some cases, even as an exercise physiologist, the best advice you can give to someone is to leave their cell phone in the kitchen so they get a good night's sleep then they wake up a little more refreshed, then at your next session you're going to you know, try and convince them to, to get that exercise that you've been trying for for years, but they never do because they wake up uh, fatigued already because they didn't have a good night's sleep. Okay, so um, in terms of, uh, of timelines, uh, this was the timeline for the systematic reviews and compositional analyses. They were all published uh, in open access, as everyone said. They went through uh, full um, peer review. Um, and the compositional analysis is also published in APNM, thanks to uh, Terry Graham and the staff at APNM for working with us on fairly tight timelines um, on some of these things. So after we had that and we crafted the guidelines, uh, we did um, a stakeholder consultation. We had 590 people respond to our survey stakeholders, some in the audience here. There's a bit of a distribution across the country. Uh, many people provided comments in addition to the, you know, do you agree strongly agree and so on and so forth. We also had people from 20 countries. So this was done through a snowball uh, sort of thing. So we sent it out to you. You might have sent it to your friends and, and so on. And so we had people from around the world respond. They told us that the information in the guidelines was clearly stated, very, very high proportion, um, and that, it was th that they agreed with the message that what we were saying they agreed with. And so, so this was great external validity of the work that we did, which was anchored in the evidence. So, so it, it was approaching what the truth was, but it's reassuring to know that the stakeholders agree with that. Then we held focus groups um, uh, with youth, with parents, 
with teachers, with pediatricians, and with exercise professionals. Perhaps some of you in the, in the audience here were, were part of those. And we wanted to discuss, are these acceptable? When we were doing the uh, sedentary behavior guidelines a number of years ago, um, we had public health professionals um, there and, and as sort of users. And as Travis said in, in his presentation, the evidence is pretty clear. No recreational screen time is the best option. I mean, it's pretty clear uh, across a lot of studies. No screen time, recreational screen time, is the best option for kids. And the public health professionals told us, well, that, that may be very well and good, but I can't go to parents and say your kids should never watch TV and, and these sorts of things. It's just not viable. And so it's the same, and, and we learned from that process and we adjusted uh, things somewhat uh, accordingly. But anyways, we wanted to assess that perceived acceptability. What are the barriers to implementing these sorts of messages? And what are the preferred methods and messengers for this information? How can we best get it to people and who will they believe? Who will they be influenced by? So we ended up with 104 participants that participated in either 20 uh, focus groups or eight interviews with one or two people. They were done in across the country in Toronto, Hamilton, Ottawa, Vancouver, Hamilton at CSEP, was that last year or two years ago in Hamilton? And they were done in English and in French. So we did the best we could to try and get a sample of people from across the country. Uh, they were audio taped, uh, transcribed verbatim, and, and all the qualitative uh, folks did their magic to, um, to find out what, what it told us. Um, and the results were very similar to the 590 people that responded to the survey. Um, we had consistent support across uh, all of the different groups that we interviewed, except youth. Youth told us they don't care. Uh, and if you have youth, you know they don't care. Um, <laughs> uh, and, and so it, it, it didn't matter what the guidelines said. They said, you know, they, they wouldn't pay attention to it anyways. Um, so that's reassuring that kids across the country are the same as my kids. Uh, the potential barriers to uptake um, were accurately defining key terms. So, so certain sticky points, uh, terms like recreational screen time, which I've been using here. What does that mean? And, and uh, we've tried to define all those. The glossary is there on the CSEP website. Uh, financial and time constraints, um, always an issue that comes up with people. Well, I can't, I can't do whatever one of the components uh, uh, because of certain constraints. Um, there, was a, there was a sense that uh, these would make parents feel guilty, which isn't the intent, of course. The intent is to advise you on what a healthy day should look like. Uh, they recommended dissemination through schools and medical settings, um, which is in large part what we're focusing on going forward. Um, Overall, participants were receptive to the new guidelines and endorsed, uh, endorsed them, basically. Uh, additional details are published also in the, uh, the open access supplement that, um, that is there. Um, and revisions were made then to the draft guidelines based on all of these focus groups and on the, uh, the feedback from the um, stakeholder survey. Um, and, and, you know, um, w while, of course, staying true to the underlying evidence, if people said, well, I don't agree with this, it should be something else, well, we wouldn't, we wouldn't adjust them accordingly if that's not what the underlying science uh, said. So th this is where the art comes in. You try and reformulate sentences and words and so on so that it addresses the confusions that might have been there while staying true to the underlying evidence. And then we enter the knowledge translation phase, uh, the development of a visual identity, that's what this is called, a visual identity, um, and related public-facing tools and resources. And so um, this work was done. This was an extra, an extra $150,000 that we got kind of at the last minute from the Public Health Agency of Canada to sort of have a route there that we could put out when we release these first guidelines because there will be a, a series of these guidelines come out for all the age groups in Canada. And they were released in conjunction with the 2016 Participation Report Card on Physical Activity for Children and Youth, which hopefully you've picked up from the Participation Table. And so we used that very effective uh, information dissemination mechanism uh, to release the guidelines. Uh, and they very cleverly uh, included this as their cover story, Are Canadian Kids Too Tired to Move? So are we too tired to move? or we don't move enough to make ourselves tired, and, and which way does this go? And it got the dialogue going in that regard. And the final official Canadian guidelines look like this. There's lots oh, of rich is... information on this slide, so I will take you through it here. How can I silence that? 
That's Veronica talking. Um, I thought I turned all those off. <laughs> well, maybe this will, this, I can just stand and watch this. That'll work, won't it? So we're going to go and, 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 and walk through the guidelines, and then I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about it. Uh, and, and I will end at the, the last slide. We'll tell you that much of this and an extended presentation is available on a webinar at the CSEP website where you can hear the whole thing from, uh, from Veronica. But that'll work, won't it? You can just talk through that? Yeah. Let's listen to Veronica. And the final official Canadian guidelines look like this. There's lots of rich information on this slide, so I will take you through it here. First, at the top, it states that for optimal health benefits, children and youth aged 5 to 17 years should achieve high levels of physical activity, low levels of sedentary behavior, and sufficient sleep each day. This That's is a general box. summary statement, and more specific information for each of these behaviors is provided in the visual representation and the accompanying text. As you can see, the visual representation of the guidelines is an outline of the number four, divided into four segments to represent the four behaviors on the movement continuum, and the size of each segment is roughly proportional to the amount of recommended time spent in that behavior each day. Beginning with sweat, the corresponding movement behavior is moderate to vigorous physical activity, and the guidelines recommend an accumulation of at least 60 minutes per day of moderate to vigorous physical activity involving a variety of aerobic activities. Vigorous physical activities and muscle and bone strengthening activities should each be incorporated at least three days per week. Next is step, representing light physical activity, for which the recommendation is for several hours of a variety of structured and unstructured light physical activities. The largest piece of the day is for sleep, and the sleep recommendations are for uninterrupted 9 to 11 hours of sleep per night for those aged 5 to 13 years, and 8 to 10 hours per night for those aged 14 to 17 years, with consistent bed and wake-up times. And lastly is sit, representing sedentary behavior, for which the recommendations are for no more than two hours per day of recreational screen time and limited sitting for extended periods. Finally, preserving sufficient sleep, trading indoor time for outdoor time, and replacing sedentary behaviors and light physical activity with additional moderate to vigorous physical activity can provide greater health benefits. To summarize, children and youth need to sweat, step, sleep, and sit the right amounts to be healthy. The guidelines are available on the CSEP um, website. Uh, messages are buried in here. So the four speeds of childhood, sweat, step, sleep, and sit. It's meant to be an alliteration. Hopefully people will memorize that. And then the details of the guidelines in time will, uh, will come with you. Okay. There we go. And so next steps. So this, um, if people have been following the guideline development in, in Canada, we've done quite a few. Uh, physical activity guidelines for the different age groups, sedentary behavior guidelines for children, sedentary behavior and physical activity guidelines for the early years, uh, most recently. Um, and typically, that's where our funding ends. We're able to find money or get a CIHR research grant or something like that to develop the guidelines, to do the background science, to write a statement and so on, and that typically is where it ends. So it's not particularly surprising to people that much of the country isn't aware of the guidelines and certainly it's not having much impact because we don't do anything with it. Um, we're hoping that that will change with this and we're, we're somewhat optimistic of that. So we do have additional dissemination plans in place like this and, and other things. Um, we were fortunate enough um, fairly recently to get um, another $1.1 million grant from the Public Health Agency to implement and activate the guidelines. We've never had this. Um, and so exactly what implementation and activation means Stay tuned, you'll see the work is underway, but there will be creative concepts, delivery mechanisms and so on to try and normalize and socialize the iconic number four, the four speeds of childhood and help people understand and implement those. Uh, to the medical professionals, to the, to the uh, exercise professionals, to the teachers, to the phys ed teachers, to the parents and so on and so forth. We also have evaluation plans and some money for evaluation, which typically doesn't flow as well. And Amy Latimer um, is, is leading that part of it, uh, of it for, uh, for us. So, and th that'll be published in due course once we have it. 
Details of, of some of these are also published in the supplemental issue uh, of APNM, so you can have a look at that. We identified research gaps, and this is your cue to write your CIHR grant or NSERC grant or SHRC grant to try and fill those voids so that when we do update these whenever in the future that we'll have better evidence, you can lean on these processes and the papers that, that we've published identifying these research gaps in your applications and say it has been identified by a very robust process led by the Canadian Society for Physiology, blah, 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 that we need more information on this. Therefore, the purpose of my grant is to. Um, so, so there you go. The, the, that background work is already done for you. And that's in, uh, in the, um, the final uh, the guidelines manuscript in the supplemental issue. We also provide recommendations for surveillance. Um, this changes the surveillance game a little bit, and so if you're familiar with the way that we currently do the surveillance for uh, physical activity guidelines, and I doubt that many of you are, are really familiar with it, um, but we use this um, uh, Bayesian uh, formula uh, that estimates, estimates six out of seven days as equaling every day for kids, and we look at the proportion of kids that actually achieve 60 minutes of moderate to vigorous physical activity on those six out of seven days, um, and that's the 9% that uh, you heard different people present here. We're going to, we've recommended different surveillance for the new guidelines because uh, the sleep guideline, the sleep information, the sedentary behavior information, and frankly most of the physical activity information is based on science where it was an average for people. And an average is a lot different than meeting something every single day. So we could have in Canada, and we almost do have an average of 60 minutes of moderate to vigorous physical activity per day for our kids. But a very small percentage meet that guideline every day because they might get 80 minutes on uh, Saturday and then Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, they didn't meet the 60 minutes and so on and so forth. So, so read, read the, uh, the paper if you're interested in more on those surveillance. Um, the focus, of course, is on a healthy movement behavior profile and no, no longer on physical activity um, because that's just one slice of it. It's just part of the puzzle. As I mentioned, we've got some recommendations there in the paper that I wrote. Um, and we've got um, a number of manuscripts, some of which have, are already submitted. Using the new guidelines and using the existing information from either the Health Behavior School Age Children's Survey, uh, some of you might be familiar with, or the Canadian Health Measures Survey, um, to, uh, to tell you the proportion of kids that are meeting the new 24-hour guidelines. And so, uh, so watch for that in the not too distant future. Planning of updates and revisions, we're recommending that this be done once every 10 years. So once we, so we're done the school age children ones, they're out there, that's what we've been presenting here. We're halfway, I would say, through doing the early years, that's age zero to four. So infants, toddlers, and preschoolers, those guidelines will come out June-ish of this coming year. And then we will begin the adults and older adults. And so in due course, there will be 24-hour movement behavior guidelines for the whole age spectrum. And then we will stop doing guidelines for a little while and let them take root uh, in approximately 10 year cycles. Mentioned several times uh, the, the papers that are in the supplemental issue. I encourage you to go to them. There's a lot of information in there, even if it's just to find out where all the information is, if you need some good citations for your background or something like that for your grant. There's a full guideline development report, more information than you would ever want to know about what we did, how we did it, why we changed that word to that word, and so on. It's all documented and transparent there for you. So if you do have uh, sleep quality issues, I suggest you go and get that report and it should resolve those <laughs> problems. <laughs> um, the webinars that you heard the, the lovely Dr. Poitras uh, present on uh, is available on the CSEB website in English and in French. More de much more detail than I provided here, uh, but is a good encapsulation of the whole, uh, the whole project. So even if you wanted your grad students or something to look at, that's a good route. We mentioned about definitions and the glossary is there as well in English and in French. And you can become a supporter of the guidelines, if you wish, on the CSEP website as well. So just to summarize and conclude, um, Canadian 24-hour movement guidelines for children and youth and integration of physical activity, sedentary behavior, and sleep. Um, 
have been developed and released, the first ones in the world, being watched very closely by countries around the world and by the World Health Organization, who I'm, I'm reasonably confident will go this route as well. And they show that the whole day matters, as if our intuition didn't already tell us that, but, it, but I think we provide very strong evidence of that. And children and youth need to sweat, step, sleep, and sit in the right amounts, not just sweat. Next steps include dissemination, implementation, activation, evaluation, future research, of course, uh, and hopefully you can help us with that, ongoing surveillance and monitoring, and um, updating and revising guidelines in due course well down the road. And it's hoped that these guidelines will open avenues for population health promotion and instigate new research on the health effects of integrated movement behaviors. I think it really has the opportunity to redirect our field. And if you start including um, these other measures in your, in your, uh, your work, you're going to find that what you thought were truths before are only partial truths. And you'll start to find that the, that the combination of things, which will differ between individuals, really matters. And so here's the guideline development team. I know you can't read this, but it's to show you that we had a, a number of research experts. And these are not just exercise physiologists, because it's not just about sweat. There are people that come from the sleep research world, from sedentary behavior research world, um, from evaluations of these, the, these worlds, measurement uh, experts, and so on. We had a number of stakeholder groups that are not traditional partners for the Canadian Society for Exercise Physiology. Um, and so just looking down the names, you know, the Conference Board of Canada, participation, of course, is a natural one, but the um, Canadian Pediatric Society. We had a mom and a daughter that, that were nobody except a mom and a daughter as part of the guideline development team to help advise us about what, what they think of these things, what, what will make them change. Um, uh, the Sea Change group was part of it, the Canadian Sleep Society, and of course, uh, CSEP. We had international collaborators from the US, Britain, and Australia that were there as well. Um, and we had five methodological consultants, people that are experts, uh, PhDs in, in the various grade and, and uh, guideline development world. And of course, we had funding and partnership from five organizations without which uh, this absolutely never would have happened. And thanks to Veronica for, for uh, speaking on one of the slides at least and helping develop most of them. All right, good evening and thanks to those of you who are still sticking around. I meant to ask Mark, did you see any waves or any up downs? Is there a score? Is there a score? Nobody knows the score? Okay. Okay, zero, zero, perfect. Um, so uh, Mark has already shown you um, the uh, reference to the paper that I'm going to speak to a little bit, so I'm going to just provide some highlights out of our paper, but again, you can go to this open access um, paper and get a little more detail on what I'm going to present today. If I can get it to work. All right, um, so the outline, I'm going to talk to you a little bit about just understanding the message and what we've heard in the last hour and a half to make sure that we're clear on what the differences are, what the new messaging is, and what are the key points that we want to try and address. I'm going to try and tell you a little bit about the information and resources that are available out there for certified professionals. I'm going to talk about our roles as well as implications in our day-to-day -day work. And then talk about the intermediaries, the collaborators, and the partnerships that we want to look at. Not just the current ones that you already work with, but maybe some unique new ones that you can spend some time working with to address the whole day concept as well. So understanding the messaging, um, for most of you, you would know then through the last uh, 45 minutes or the original, sorry, the introductory um, time period was that these are based on evidence. And so it's really important that we do sort of lean on that information to say that this is coming from an evidence-based approach, that there is a paradigm shift, that there is new information and a new paradigm to consider in the way of a whole day um, and how it is important to consider that across the 24-hour cycle. Uh, we've heard clearly that all the activities are necessary, but it's really about how we distribute that time throughout that 24-hour period. And it is the combination or the integration or the balance of those movement behaviors that is important with respect to health. And we've heard a little bit about sort of the combinations and what adds to your health, what takes away from your health. And so that information is also available there. 
Um, when we look at that, I did highlight the light intensity because that is something new for us. When we talk about total physical activity, most of the physical activity guidelines in the early years was around moderate to vigorous activity. We always say more is better, but we didn't have a lot of research that would sort of um, have us bring that home. And so now we're really talking about the importance of that light physical activity as well. Um, we've got the focus on replacement of excessive sedentary activities and the different types of sedentary activities as well. So hopefully that message is coming clear as well. And then we've heard about the sleep patterns. Um, you know, the consistent go to bed time, the consistent wake up times, the duration as well. And so we can talk to that in our strategies as well. So it's been a few years since we had the physical activity guidelines for children and youth and then the physical activity and sedentary behaviors for children and youth and now this is an opportunity for us to renew, refresh, repackage information and make sure that we go forward on the whole day concept. Um, in the past, we've had lots of media attention with regards to our guidelines release, and we continue to see that ever since we released these ones in particular in June. We continue to see large uh, uptake from the media, and we'll continue to do so as we go into the early years and the older adults, adults, and on our tenure uh, proposed cycle as well. Um, one of the things that we do want to talk about is with the visual identity and some of the messaging that we're going to talk about is that, you know, some of the frameworks out there about how you disseminate messages and how do people remember them is really important that we focus on a consolidated single message about movement and that movement continuum. It does facilitate greater remembrance of that message and so some of these things that we've talked about around the visual identity is there to, to make sure that people do recall really easily. Um, and it creates opportunities for us to leverage one movement behavior um, to another. Um, in the past, when we focus on just one, now we're going to be able to talk about if you do this, it will affect this behavior as well. So it gives us that med messaging opportunity. The implications for the, full, the whole day, we've heard from others as well, some examples of how this can broaden our scope of interventions. So going beyond just physical activity and some aspects of sedentary behavior, but talking about all those other components as well. It gives us greater possibilities for being inclusive across the movement continuum and more, more feasibility when we talk about a 24-hour cycle as well. It allows us to look at collaborations with other organizations, maybe some that we currently work with, but also some new unique opportunities in the way of partnerships too. We can share information, tools, strategies, tips um, with our partners and look at sort of funding collaborations as well. So um, most of you will know we're more successful in going after grants and funding opportunities when we have broad partnerships and this gives us that opportunity. And finally, from a framework of an interdisciplinary practice approach, whether it be in healthcare, public health, um, in the school system, et cetera, that when we bring our synergies together from a multidisciplinary perspective and do it integratedly across interdisciplinary frameworks, that we do see greater positive outcomes overall for the center, which would be children and youth in this particular case. So for those of you who aren't familiar um, with what is available for you as, as practitioners and professionals, um, from CSEP's perspective, there's been plenty of e-news communication that goes out with regards to the, the launch of the guidelines and information um, that is available um, in, in electronic form. We have the tear sheets. Um, so this example here was in everybody's delegate package. They're also available with a report card um, in the trade show area. We have the infographics, there's case studies, so lots of information on the web pages of CSEP and hopefully linking from other partners as well. We have social media materials that is available. Um, Mark alluded to the workshops and the webinars that are available as well. So if you want to get more information and have the material available and disseminate um, that, that is available for you. Um, we started out with physical activity questionnaires. We've moved to the physical activity and sedentary behavior questionnaire, and we're looking at sort of more areas of questionnaires to incorporate all the movement behaviors. And there will be addendums that will go with the CPATH material and a lot of the different resources we use in um, our training process for certified individuals as well. So as certified professionals, we have a number of different roles. Uh, we are the end user um, of this whole process. And so, you know, it's been great in the last 10 years to be involved and have um, a piece of the pie from the perspective of the certified professional um, and including this in our scope of practice. The one thing that I do want to recognize, of course, is that those individuals who are certified personal trainers don't have the ability to work with children and youth in their scope of practice, but they certainly do have access to the intermediaries either in their parents 
parents or family practitioners who work with children and youth or maybe people working in rec centers or whatever it may be. Um, so there are other avenues for the certified personal trainers to absolutely be involved in disseminating this message and putting it to practice. For the CEPs, it is part of the scope of practice, so we have lots of strategies that we can work with there. Um, so our role is to assist in the dissemination, whether it's indirectly for the CPTs or directly for the CEPs, and trying to activate these guidelines. And as Mark said, and I'm going to talk in a little bit about, you know, we got some funding, hopefully, fingers crossed, coming our way in making that happen in 2017. Um, so our job is to practice the guidelines, put them into place, advise about healthy lifestyles, and across that movement continuum. Uh, we also have a role to play in influencing the intermediaries who service our children and youth um, and activate those guidelines through their programs and services. So, you know, we need to reach out um, and, and access some new partners and, and get them involved in the process as well. So what can we do? Well, as uh, professionals, we should be knowledgeable, be well aware of the background behind the guidelines and make sure that we're aware and we can respond to questions about the information. But we really do need to move um, beyond just disseminating them and being aware of them. We need to look at tools, strategies, and ways to actually activate them. Uh, so it's important that we obtain information, we share that information. That's one step, obviously, through professional development, educational development, um, but also thinking about who can we influence. So it's not just about us educating ourselves, but who else can we educate? How do we influence them? And what are the strategies to do that? So uh, also as a professional, you want to make sure that whatever tools and strategies and tips that you have at your fingertips, that you're going to add this new information, you're going to maybe change or create new tools so that you can use that in your day-to-day -day practice, and provide that information to the partners that you work with as well so they can incorporate it into their own tips, tools, and resources. And it's really interesting to see um, when you're working with um, different people to try and create the messaging around really getting thinking out of the box and creating new things. Um, you know, the definition of insanity, if you keep doing the same thing, you're going to get the same result or don't expect something different. So if we keep just doing the same kind of dissemination plans that we've been doing for the last 10 years, we're not going to see any greater uptake. So we need to get outside, think outside the box and, and see some greater change. So we talked about, uh, Mark alluded to, we've got some dissemination funding coming, so we'll see that in 2017. That'll help us activate the guidelines a little bit more. We've talked about the visual identity, which is great from a, a recall perspective and a talking, a storyboard to be able to pass the message on. Um, you know, looking at the novel approaches will have greater impact, but we also recognize as well that that will take time and resources in order to do that. Um, really important that you do seek those collaborations and work with other people, that interdisciplinary approach that will have that synergistic effect and have greater outcomes as well. And when we do that collaboration, we can look at minimizing any duplication. So let's share our information, our tools and resources so that we are not all doing the same thing. So it's really important that we um, engage not just different disciplines, but also the different sectors, and that we create tools that we can all use that are easily accessible, adaptable, targeted, and clear. So from a day-to-day -day perspective, the, the primary role that a lot of us play is that we educate the general public on what guidelines are and what those healthy behaviors are and how they incorporate them throughout their day. Um, and for many of us, we're already providing education on more than just physical activity, but you know, it, it's a greater invitation for everybody else also to continue to look at that whole movement spectrum. Um, so talking about how can you look at the day and, and distributing that time for sure. It is a holistic approach to health and wellness. Um, so when we've in the past talked about movements from the perspective of doing an assessment or prescription or goal setting, or maybe there's been a heavy focus on physical activity, now we can start to doing some assessments on sedentary behavior. We can do assessments on sleep patterns and duration. We can talk about goal setting in that area and prescription in that area as well. When we talk about that 24 hour clock and we look at that pie and talk to people about how to move different pieces or make certain pieces of the pie larger by replacing different areas. So I think it's important not just to disseminate it, but also practice the guidelines ourselves and getting other people to make sure that they're activating them. 
So some of the current partners we maybe want to look at, as well as new partners that we can consider as well. Um, a couple of the other uh, speakers also alluded to some of these partners, Exercises Medicine Canada and our allied health partners. If we talk about a holistic approach, the Exercises Medicine Canada has the vital sign, and they're asking um, uh, physicians to talk to their patients on every visit about exercise. So now maybe they need to incorporate that information around the 24-hour uh, movement guidelines and talking about uh, doing the vital sign across all movement behaviors, not just physical activity. There's a whole conversation that had, needs to happen in um, government around fee structures and incentives for physicians to talk to their patients about counseling um, around physical activity. Currently, as a prevention activity, that's not funded in most areas, um, but looking at some of the, the models around integrated healthcare teams, family care teams, where there is some incentive to be able to do some of this work at that level. One of the other key partners um, in the way of um, getting these guidelines out there is the schools. And we've done a really good job of looking at getting it into the curriculum from a physical activity perspective and now the sedentary behavior aspect as well. But we're talking about more than just that. It's not just the PE curriculum, it's not just foods, it's not just health. It's also looking at that pie and sort of an example of what Mark shared with the compositional analysis where we could use this in a subject matter such as in the math class where they can talk with the students about if you were to shift this much light activity into sedentary, what does that do? Use it as a math example and a word problem. So I think it's really important that we start to talk about getting these into sort of all the curriculum that's seen in the schools. Also throughout the day, and we've had a huge movement around um, physical activity and sedentary behavior and thinking about that throughout the day in the school systems, but now we can also add that into talking about the start times. And, and JP mentioned the fact that, you know, is starting at 7 a.m., 8 a.m., 8.30, whatever, the best thing for a teenagers when they're going to school? Are they going to be active and, and energetic and be able to think first thing in the morning? So we need to start talking about what are the best times to incorporate and start school when does school end? Um, and and then with the physical activity pieces, we've already discussed for the last number of years, is it's not just during PE, it's not during just during recess. We're going to incorporate that throughout the day. It's small energy bursts throughout the day, breaking up the sedentary sitting times, looking at other strategies around um, how do you incorporate more standing time and light activity in the school day. Okay. So we're really looking at the whole environment approach and there's lots of different um, healthy schools kind of activities that are out there that incorporate this and have a comprehensive approach to address all the movement behaviors. We're going to have to look at sort of reinventing the wheel around um, train the trainer kind of information when we talk to teachers about giving them the professional development so that we can provide them with the education around the guidelines as well. And so, you know, as certified professionals that are connected already to the school systems, you can start to take this information out to them right now. Get involved in the local professional development days, get involved in conferences and start spreading this information. Some of the other partners as well, um, again, we've been dealing with some of these partners in the physical activity, sedentary behavior world for a while now, but now we need to start sort of talking about that continuum of movement activities. So after school programs, art and recreation programs, the different youth organizations that are going to be addressing and dealing with um, programming for children and youth, we need to start sharing the messages about reducing the sedentary time, banning screens during these programming, increasing light activity during the down periods, and talking about those sleep-friendly schedules of doing this programming when it's prime time for them and not interfering with their sleep patterns. So again, another sector that we're um, pretty familiar with, which is national and provincial sport organizations. How do we influence coaches and leaders who are dealing with um, children and youth in their uh, sector? And again, around sleep-friendly schedules, I know many of you in the room often complain with me at the wine and cheese about you know, the 6 a.m. hockey practice, the 10 p.m., whatever it may be, um, at the arts center. And so we need to really consider and working with these people about having these programs be at a time that is appropriate that now is going to start to consider sleep time for the children and youth as well. Likewise, in practice planning, um, we know from physical education and even practices for that perspective that they aren't, children and youth are not active all the time. So how do we get them to do some of the light activity when they're sort of waiting for their turn to do the drill or their turn to take the shot or whatever it may be? So, you know, really working with the coaches and the leaders to keep the movement activity going and reducing the amount of, of waiting time and sedentary time. 
For many of us, it's sort of looking at other organizations and how do we work with them. And if you do look at the papers and if you look at the information on the CSEP website, there is process paper um, information in there about all the organizations that were involved in the development of the 24-hour movement guidelines uh, for the children and youth. And there's some new partners in that group that we really need to engage and get them involved. Um, so I've listed a couple of them there that, you know, some of them we're familiar with and some of them are new for us, but we definitely need to sort of look at that holistic approach, the 24-hour cycle and the whole day. So making sure that they also update their websites. So that's something that we often stumble across is that we launch new guidelines, but then we go and look at a public health uh, website somewhere else and they still have the guidelines from five years ago. They haven't updated their information. So making sure that we catch these and that we educate people that they need to update their own web pages. For a lot of these organizations in this category, it's their policies, their practices, and their procedures that needed to be updated so that they can reference the right information and get that information out in their own policies. Mark spoke to surveillance, um, and so uh, addressing the issue around making sure that we have the right measurement techniques, techniques and tools that will address all the movement behaviors. So we need to start doing that. And similarly, all presenters have spoken to the research gaps. And so as certified professionals, um, you know, we can provide lots of information that will make sure that um, some of these organizations that we work with will start to address all the movement behaviors across a 24-hour cycle in some of their research agendas. So the last thing I would say is, um, as I'm trying to wrap up quickly so that you can get going for your Friday night, is that um, as professionals, it's really important that you're prepared, prepared for an opportunity. Um, a lot of the information that we try and get out and people that we talk to, sometimes we only get two, three minutes, very short sound bites that we have an opportunity to say something to somebody who is important, somebody who can influence something. So it's really important that you as a professional, that you can, can try and condense the message down into a couple of minutes, into a paragraph, so that when you do that, have the opportunity that you can provide the right information to the right person. So make sure you know what is new, what is important, and what's the main takeaway. So you'll hear it, you've heard it lots over the last couple of days about the whole day and it matters. It's about the different activities and how you distribute them. Um, so that will be the continuous message that you want to try and get out there. And the last piece that I'll just say as practitioners is that there is this two-way process between practice and research. So as we go out and we try and practice these guidelines, it's important as you as professionals that you also receive feedback from your clients, from your partners, your collaborators, all the intermediaries that you work with, that you're hearing information about what's working, what's not working. Because a lot of time the practice that we do and the feedback when we say it's not working for us anymore will actually drive the research, it will help drive the cycle of revision and revamping. And so there is this two-way process that research guides what we will do with practice, but our practice will help guide the research agenda, and that's really important. And that's the end for me. I'm not sure if there's any time. <laughs> <laughs>